Um, and recording is starting also, great, thank you. So my name is Musa Elbari, I'm a researcher at Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. And I'm collaborating together with Matlust and Södertälje Municipality and helping organizing this seminar together with also Hans and Maria. Hans, do you wanna start? Yeah, uh, my name is Hans uh, and I'm working for Beras International, Hans von Essen, and uh, I'm also in, uh, in the preparation group and making this seminar together. And my role in this seminar will be to uh, catch up uh, questions that you have. If uh, I prefer that you uh, just turn on your microphone and speak or put up your hand, but some may have problem with that. And then, uh, then I will help with that. And I will, will also see if there are some questions at the end that are not asked, then I will come in and, and, and ask those questions. So then back to Maria. Yep. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm very pleased to be welcome, welcoming you to this seminar about grass-fed milk uh, on behalf of Matlust. The Matlust uh, European Regional Development Fund project and we support small and middle-sized food companies in the Stockholm area to grow and, and to grow sustainably. Um, we are also now developing a food for food and uh, for sustainability. And in addition to this, we have also added what is called a transnational component to Matlust. And in this transnational component, we are uh, looking to our neighboring countries in the Baltic Sea region and uh, trying to locate interesting cases, interesting and good examples of how small and medium-sized food companies may increase uh, their role in, in sustainable and resilient food systems. And this seminar today is part of this transnational work that we do. And I will leave then the word to, back to me, who will be our moderator today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Uh, so what will happen now, I will leave the, the stage to our guests of honor here, uh, Peder and uh, Torsten from Tise uh, who will explain more about grass-fed milk, the very interesting example that we would like to learn more about. And then after that, uh, Klaus Jusch is here also from Jusch Meri uh, Dairy, uh, that will uh, ask questions and have a bit of a conversation together and then uh, we will open up the stage in the end or I mean open up for questions from the audience also in the end so you know this is the plan so now over to uh, Torsten and Peter yeah thank you very much we greatly appreciate that you have the opportunity to tell them about the little dream of uh, Tisa and in order to guide us, um, then we have a small presentation. So if you could put that on the screen, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, basically, we are going to put that into three parts. <clears throat> and my name is Peter Jessen, and I'm part of the commercial team and heading the commercial team. And uh, the real knowledge is actually part, uh, partly done by by Torsten, who is the initiator and founder of the great idea in CISA and the reason for we are being here today. So the presentation will shortly be like a part one, which is historical data, and then Torsten will bring you through the grasp of concepts. Um, and then I'll tell a little bit about how do we commercialize, because it's great to have a great concept, but it's even better if you're able to, to make it a commercial success. So. So that was a start. So if you could put us to the next slide. I don't, don't want to bore you about a lot of company facts, but, but I need to do a very short introduction of TISA. TISA is founded back in 1988, based on a conventional dairy, which was founded in nine, eight, uh, nine, 1887. But uh, seven crazy farmers went to this uh, big day dairy in 1988, 
and asked for a production of organic products. Um, and that was the uh, start of Caesar Dairy. If I just go into some very small facts and figures, back in 1997, we actually was, had a, having a turn of 9 million euro, had 9.2 million uh, kilos of shareholder milk, 1,500 cows, 39 shareholders, and 30 employees. If we then move 20 years ahead, we actually had a turnover of 130 million and weighing in around the area of 100 million kilos of shareholder milk, approximately 11,000 hardworking cows and 71 uh, shareholders and 235 employees. If we just take the picture today, we are in the process of un uh, reaching 160 million euros and they're weighing in approximately 110 uh, million kilos of milk and they have approximately uh, 14,000 cows. And uh, if you ask Thorsten, which is uh, part of our board, we might be too many employees. We are 250 employees. <laughs> so basically, we are an organic uh, dairy founded back in 1988. And um, yeah, and we're growing year by year. Um, not that growth is, is something we need to do. We just would like to keep our shareholders uh, happy uh, and make sure that we are able to sell the milk at a fairly okay price. That was the historical data I want to reveal about CISA, just in numbers. And then I'll give the word to Torsten, who will tell about the basic idea uh, about the grass-fed milk. What is the criteria and the story behind the grass-fed milk? Yes. Thank you, for, thank you for, uh, for asking us to, to do this presentation for you. Uh, yeah, that's me on the picture there with the calf from my farm. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, I'm the fifth generation on this farm. We have been a, a dairy farm here in my family since 1851. And uh, I took over the farm in uh, 1998. Uh, before that, I studied agronomy on uh, the University of, of Copenhagen from uh, 90 to 96. And uh, maybe it was during my studies there that I began to think about these ideas about energy conservation. Uh, there are different ways into uh, different ways into getting an idea of what grass fed milk is. One of them is to look on this energy cons conservation. Uh, as farmers, we are dependent on the energy from the sun. It's the basis of our income, this free energy from the sun. And this energy is converted through this uh, um, uh, photosynthesis, I think it's called in English, <laughs> um, uh, which it, converts the energy from the sun to plant material which we can uh, digest and uh, this process gives us a lot of energy but when we take this energy from the plants and put this this material through an animal we lose some energy so the the an important thing to understand is that we should minimize the number of plants we put through animals to be able to feed more people. So, uh, in fact, we should only live off plants. That's <laughs> the idea. Uh, and then we have this, the other, another important thing uh, when we have, when we are organic farmers, we have to have a healthy uh, plant uh, system. I'm not exactly sure about the English word, but we, the, the crops, uh, crop rotation, it's called. And in this crop rotation, we need to have clover grass in about 25% of the area of the land to be able to have a healthy organic soil. And the idea is then, of course, that the best way to use this clover grass we have any way to be able to have a rich soil where we, we have uh, nitrogen and we have uh, an increase of carbon bound in the soil. Uh, we use this grass for feed for cows. That is the 
best way, in my opinion, to use this material we have anyway. So in that way, we are able to generate uh, food for human beings from a uh, from material where we can't digest it, grass. Another aspect of this is that uh, cows are ruminants and ruminants developed about 26 million years ago in collaboration with the with the existence of existence of grass and the, the grass and ruminants have coexisted since, since for the past 26 million years and in my point of view there has been this uh, this big co coexistence with which has developed uh, the way a ruminant works today and we should not interfere in this process and i think also from our studies we have been studying my milk uh, for four years with the part participation of the university of aarhus uh, they have found that this milk from cows only fed with grass is it's more healthy there is a higher level of these uh, healthy fatty acids unsaturated fatty acids and there's a higher percent a higher uh, level of um, uh, what's it called uh, antibiotic no anti antioxidants and uh, also a higher level of uh, minerals and also uh, higher levels of vitamins in fact you can in a way compare uh, milk from cows that are only fed with grass, you can compare that the oil in this milk or the fatty content of this milk with the, uh, the fat that comes from fish oil. So if you feed your cows with, with grains or with maize or something else, this level uh, decreases. So in, in a way it's, it's uh, eating milk from cows that are only fed with grass is as healthy as eating fish I normally say, I don't know if it's totally correct, but uh, so that is it, the principles and uh, how it started. Uh, just to finish, uh, we in TC we had this uh, uh, we had this uh, uh, climate action plan. We have made that twice for our farmers in 2013 and again in 2016, and we we were dealing with how can we on the farm decrease our climate emissions and. From that plan, I could easily see that the, the, the best way to do it was to decrease the number of cows. So, and that was that was in in a, in a good. Um, it, it was working well together with my other ideas, as I just explained. So, the idea is to minimize or to lower your number of cows to increase the food production from the farm and to, to the milk you'll deliver from the farm is in a more healthy uh, way. Yes, thank you for me. So Peter, it's now yeah. to you. I'll just give you a quick review through the commercial side of grass-fed, uh, the grass-fed concept, why are we doing it? But first of all, I would say the reason for we are able to do the grass-fed, that is that we have a completely unique uh, distribution system that means when we actually pick up the milk from Torsten or other of our shareholders, then basically we have five uh, tanks on each, in each truck. So today we have 11 different types of milk and we're able to separate that uh, in the distribution system into the dairy and apart from that also in terms of doing that when we are in the, our production facility. Um, very short, why? What is the role of grass-fed patisa and the dairy? Basically, our key to success is innovation. Grass-fed products are ex extremely easy to understand for consumers, and our customers really rely on us doing the innovation, and they love the grass-fed concept. Basically, it was launched in 19, or 2017, and uh, there you can see Torsten is there, and there's also a little little small man in the middle, which is the managing director of Co-op Denmark, and basically our customers really 
love us and we create a lot of customer loyalty by launching uh, unique concepts. And uh, it's also a big uh, part of us being uh, number one in SBI, which is a Swedish company called Brand Sustainability. And uh, there we are rated as the most uh, <coughs> uh, sustainable product for the third year in a row, uh, which we appreciate. Next slide, please. To us, uh, the grass concept, apart from being very unique, it's part of uh, our way to make sure that we maintain a super brand. In Denmark, we and other markets, you have what you call the BAW. I wouldn't doubt that is a very uh, competent system of evaluating brand values. Uh, and actually, Cheat is named as a super brand. And uh, part of this is basically also that grass with milk is very critical because it's, it's uh, easy to explain to consumers and easily understand. So grass-fed is not only a concept in the mind of Torsten, it's also a concept which is appreciated by the consumers. Next slide, please. Uh, we actually started in 19, uh, 2017 just with uh, a milk containing 4.2% fats. Uh, then later we have added like yogurt, spring phrase, butter, and uh, lately, but not uh, most, <coughs> but importantly, also the minimum 0.5 and a special cheese, uh, grass, summer cheese, which has been launched this year. So the wider the range, the stronger the visibility. And I, I'm not mentioning any commercial figures, but uh, the organic growth basically is plus 15% uh, year on year. And then, of course, when we do the line extensions, uh, the, the growth is even stronger. So we expect to double approximately this year and also try to double in the year of 2022. Next slide, please. The way we actually did it, uh, the distribution strategy, that is that it was basically launched in high-end retail, meaning like a customer like Yemen in the Copenhagen area. We are also doing supporting distribution in high-end cafes, bakers, and hotels. So if you're in the Copenhagen area, you go to Emery's, you go to the bakery Hearts, or you go actually sometimes they're doing promotions in during the juice. So we're trying to go a little bit uh, high-end and in, in order to support the, the positioning of, of the grass fed milk. Right now, we are in the process of penetrating uh, because we have made what we call proof of concept. So we're going to extend and uh, penetrating new customers with the grass fit milk and uh, the grass fit uh, concept. So um, it has been very well uh, received. And uh, I should also mention to Austin that we have a premium price at retail approximately plus 20% to 25% compared with other organic products. And then the final slide. How do we promote it? Actually, the distribution strategy for us has been key to making sure that we are at the right places where the consumers are willing to pay a premium plus 20 to plus 23. But of course, we are supporting that with so many activities and also professional uh, media or shop in shop restaurants, uh, install material, and trade ads, which is very important in Denmark. Uh, but when we do trade ads with uh, the grass fed concept, we're not doing it on price, we're doing that via uh, storytelling. So that was a short flight in with uh, the commercial side of uh, grass fed milk. And uh, today, and uh, without saying, this is going to be a little bit of, of the dream of cheese. And I would love that in 10 years time, all con consumers were willing to pay 20 to 25 plus on, on price. And then we had actually been driving this concept into a more, you could say, normal consumption. But uh, we have a little way to go. So I guess now we are at uh, 1521, Maria. So we more or less uh, kept the timetable. So that's all for me. Great, well done. Thanks for a really good presentation. Very interesting. And now we also welcome in Klaus. Uh, so, and that we will have a bit of a first a conversation among, among you. Um, Klaus, can you also introduce yourself? 
Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm my name is Klaus Jusch, and I'm running this small diary, cheese making diary called Jusch Meiri in the, in the middle of Sweden, in the middle of Sörmland, as a region 10, uh, 100 kilometers south of Stockholm. <clears throat> uh, we are buying uh, organic milk from uh, Arla, but it comes from uh, two farms uh, nearby us five, six kilometers only. And it comes directly from, from the farm to us and we pasteurize all the milk that we make cheese from. Uh, we are not making any consumed milk or yogurt or some, anything like that. We have enough work to, to supply our customers with cheese. So, but we have, of course, a big problem with um, uh, this uh, butter acid bacterias that uh, would be a, a big help, I think, with uh, with only grass milk, because uh, we, we are, haven't the, the equipment to, to uh, centrifuge away the, those bacterias. And they, of course, if they are uh, making spores, they are uh, surviving the, the pasteurization. Uh, so, uh, Sometimes uh, in a couple of months, especially on the autumn and so, we have great problems with making hard cheese uh, with, with the milk. So uh, it will be very interesting for us. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I think it have to, we have to go uh, by side of Arla. I don't think uh, Arla will support us with this problem, but uh, uh, we don't know it yet. But, uh, We'll see. Um, Klaus, yes. Uh, there are two clarifying questions in the chat. I don't know if you have seen them, but I wonder if it is not the right time to let them in. One about uh, how the feeding is uh, in in practice, reaching uh, uh, with grass-fed milk a high degree from uh, of milk production from Stefan, and then also how much extra the farmers are paid uh, for the milk. I think you could ask that from the, how much the farmers are getting taught and then I can take the consumer side. Yes. Yes. Uh, farmers, we are paid uh, 81 Danish euro on top of the organic price. Uh, so yeah, uh, at the moment now it's about four krona 50. Uh, in that area for Krona 50 Danish price. About the feeding of the cows, uh, uh, we, we are, they are fed uh, with grass uh, all the way. No animals have anything apart from grass. So it means uh, directly when they are, from they are small, they have milk, of course, and then they also are offered grass and then they eat grass their whole life. And it also applies for or we have some uh, bullocks for, for slaughtering. They are also grass-fed. Uh, in and it varies, of course, during the, the time of the year. So I'm not sure you can get rid get rid of these spore in the dairy because uh, we we are not feeding them with hay, which should get rid of this spore problem. So, but we, we feed them grass silage in winter time. So uh, in summertime, they have uh, 24 hours of grass from outside day and night, about four to five months. And then we have this period in the springtime and in the autumn, about one month, maybe two months where they are outside in the daytime and we have them inside at nighttime. And then we have in Denmark with our climate, we have about uh, four months to five months where they are in the cow house day and night. It started, they are still out in daytime now and in uh, maybe about 1st of, of December, we will take them in and then they can go out in daytime in uh, about April. Yes. Peter? Thank you. Peter, did you want to say something more on the consumer side? You're basically, I think with the, what we mentioned, toast, that means the farmers are actually paid in the area of plus 25% uh, add-on on the current price, and consumers are paying approximately 20% more. And uh, that is possible among 
in urban areas and like Copenhagen and Aarhus, but of course, if you go on the Danish West Coast or to Lolland, that's pretty harder to, 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 to get a premium of 20. But, but uh, approximately 20% of the consumers are willing in urban areas to pay that price without any problem. Thank you. Klaus, did you have more questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I I can um, respond on that. We are willing to pay at least as much extra as the as, as Torsten get for for uh, the milk, if we can avoid the problem with the battery acid bacteria. Uh, so it would be worth a lot for us. It's just a question about transportations and so. I think uh, so. so um, well, it's it's a big big uh, help to us for for our production and everything. And, and the, the, our customers uh, can be more, they can rely on us uh, by, uh, so we can be sure that we can deliver uh, what they ask for. So it's, uh, everything is a shame, <laughs> but the problem is the milk quality from the beginning. And I think uh, we can uh, avoid a lot of problems by uh, uh, grass milk. Uh, we have a question also from Helena. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very interested in what uh, uh, Klaus at Jushmeri says about the butter acid bacteria, because I worked 30 years ago with Jana Meiri, and we had a lot of problems with that. And actually, as I understood that Torsten was saying, it's the silage that is the problem, not actually you don't solve the problem by just uh, uh, don't giving any any uh, uh, any cereals or things like that. So uh, when when cows are grass fed, if you want to get rid of the problem, you have class. I think no silage. Or and no. I, I would want to know how tea dairy uh, solves this problem. Do you have these centrifuges or how do you? deal with it. Uh, is it you, Peter? Must be hmm? Peter. Peter. <laughs> you do it. You do it, uh, Charles. That's OK. Yeah, but, but uh, OK, I, I'll try it. You can correct me, Peter. But uh, in TC, we have these centrifuges for getting rid of spore, but we, it's always a problem for us also. And we have, we are paid as farmers, uh, or we have a fine if we deliver milk with spore. And we have, uh, our milk is always tested. And I, I also, as a, a grass-fed producer, sometimes have problems with the spore, and it comes from the silage. Yeah. And I know from other dairies in Denmark, the, who, who have uh, is called they call hay milk mm -hmm. where they only have air dried hay instead of uh, uh, grass covered in, on the plastic and this uh, hay milk should be free from spore and it's the same they produce in the Alp region yeah. so, we, we uh, have that experience from from Jana where I worked with it Yes. We, we didn't find any other solution. We really were struggling. It's 30 years ago. <laughs> so, but, uh, but as a farmer there, it, it comes from the silage. But as a farmer, you can do many things. It, it is, it is uh, it's not coming from inside the cow. It's coming from, it's going to this, the, the cow shit and the cow shit to the teats. And you get it from the skin of the teats outside into the milk. So the question is to clean the other completely or correct, for example, using some soap uh, and then clean the other very carefully, then you can get rid of uh, this spore. So it is a mechanical thing. It's not something that is coming from inside the cow. So it's, it is not impossible. It is, you, you should just, just take more care when you milk That's as a farmer. Yes, uh, uh, I know about that. But if there is, um, if you minimize uh, the 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 bacteria from the beginning, the spores from the beginning, uh, without having this silage uh, to feed them with, you you can uh, of course uh, reach uh, your aim 
uh, on, in a better and easier way. So I think um, if you get rid of, rid of this silage, you, you, you are almost there. Already. So uh, Margareta at SLU also had a comment on the same topic, um, that it is possible to feed cows with silage and avoid Clostridia spores. Uh, there are many things you can do, but of course hay would help, she says. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have another yeah. question from the chat here that has to do with Torsten, and that is about how you decide the size of the herd in relation to the uh, 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 area of of, uh, of the farm in order to uh, optimize the use of, of, of animals. How many animal units do you have per hectare? Yes. Uh... It depends on a on a evaluation on the specific farm. For example, we have I was talking about that of this arable land, the land we can use for plant production, for human consumption. For example, potatoes, grains, vegetables. This area, ideally, you should have about twenty five percent to maybe thirty percent, maybe thirty five percent of this area with grass. With with clover grass and uh, from there you can calculate back on how many cows you can have it also depends if you if you keep the heifers if you keep the bulls and so on and also another aspect is uh, the meadows on my particular farm i have about uh, 50 60 hectares of meadows which can only be used for for grass for ruminants so it depends on how your farm is, but uh, I would say about uh, these about 30% maybe about of your arable uh, area, you should have with grass and then you can just calculate. You have to have grass for the cows. You also have to have enough grass so you can have make silage or make hay for the winter time. Hmm. So definitely much less than one cow per hectare. Uh, I have uh, 408 hectares and I have 120 cows. Yeah. So I have maybe about three, uh, three hectares per cow. Thank yeah, you. that is certainly a bit less than what, what I'm used to. Uh, we're talking about from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 animal units per hectare and sometimes up to one animal unit per hectare to get a balance depending on how uh, uh, how fertile the land is, uh, but you are recommending actually uh, a bit less in order to optimize uh, the production, I understand. Yes, but it, it's because I, I would also, most farmers have more cows because they are focusing on how many cows they can have. Mm. Here we are focusing on how much food we can produce and on my, on my particular farm, we calculated that if I should optimize the number of cows to my land, I could have about 300 cows, maybe 350 cows. And these cows could give food for about 1,000 people. If I reduce the number of cows to these 120 and then produce more vegetable food, for direct consumption for humans, I could feed or make food for about 3,000 3, people. So I can make food for about three times as, as many people with by reducing the number of cows. And this, the, 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 the reason for this is, of course, this energy loss, which we, which I explained before. We have this energy loss by putting plants through cows, for example, grains, if we use grains for cow feed, there's a big energy loss. And you will still have enough of manure for the uh, other arid land for the plant growing, or do you have to buy uh, something to manure the rest of the farm? Yes, that's a, a, a very uh, interesting question because uh, yeah, in Denmark, we, we are this grass fed 
concept we have in TSE. We are, we are, we have to produce uh, under the level of sixty-five kilos of uh, nitrogen per hectare. Uh, it's, it's. I don't know if it's the same in Sweden, but in Denmark we have this uh, extensivation. Uh, is it called that ex, extens, extensivering study? It's called in Danish ex, ex yeah. Extensification so, so, support. Yeah. We have uh, we get 500 Danish kroner uh, per hectare if we have less uh, nitrogen per hectare than these 65 kilos. So we we are going under that level, and so you can say we we maybe have a little bit we are a little bit short of nitrogen, but then we have these extra money from the government because we are we are producing in a way which. The government wants us to do uh, having less nitrogen in the environment, but you're you're right. It's it's a it's, it's a question. Uh, there also I also use uh, sometimes I use uh, I even have I have much less nitrogen than 65 from my own cows, so I have the possibility to import some manure from other farms or to import. Uh, I, I, I'm doing that. Uh, this, uh, uh, what's it called in English? Uh, in, da in Danish, it's have a park. I felt when, when people from uh, who has a garden, they cut down some branches and grass and trees. They uh, deliver them to this our local uh, place, and they store them for a couple of years, and it, it converts into some black, uh, yeah, compost thing and we can get that back as farmers and I'm I'm doing that also so I get it's kind of a circular hmm. circular system but of course there's not nearly enough for all farmers of that product thank you um there's also a clarifying question in the chat from Stefan um that does the cows are fed 100 percent grass no grain or protein feeds or fats yeah 100 yes, 100 percent and there's also a question for Klaus from Anhelien. Um, have you been in contact with milk farmers directly who use only hay or grass? Yes, I saw that question. Uh, we have started some conversation with one of our uh, uh, farmers that delivers milk to us. And um, if we find a, a good solution for it, we will, I think we will uh, pay a lot more for that milk, so it be worth to, for the farmer too. So yes, <laughs> we have started the conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question to to uh, Peter. Yes, and uh, it's about the yield. Uh, is uh, do you f when when you make you you said you ma made one cheese from this grass milk, one type of cheese at uh, Tisa Mary. And uh, how about the yield uh, comparing to uh, other milk? Do you know anything about that? <clears throat> I do hope I understand the question correctly. Uh, yeah, we're only doing one cheese. We always start with the mother product, which is uh, milk. And then we actually convert it into a complete concept, including cheese. Uh, if you talk about how much milk to be used, compared with finished products, then it's still around 10 liters per kilo if we make like a firm cheese. Mm -hmm. Was that an answer to your question? Yeah, I understand, yes. Uh, the, the, we, we, we doesn't do anything else but cheese here, so we don't separate anything, any milk at all. We do it from whole milk, we make, we make our cheese. So uh, sometimes uh, we notice uh, it's a higher yield uh, depending on where on, on the year we are, on, on the, it's a, it's more fat and protein in, in the milk. And the, uh, well, basically, I believe that the value is in the CSR and basically the quality of the milk mm -hmm. and a very easy storage to understand from a consumer point of view. So, so we also do a 2A2 milk. It's pretty hard to explain any consumer what is A2A2 two two milk, but when you have the grass fed concept, it's so easy to understand, hence you also get the consumer acceptance, and hence you get a commercial value immediate without spending a lot of money. So, yeah. OK, 
Klaus, do you have more questions that you would like to, before we take some more questions in the chat? Uh, no, I, I, is there any practical problems in the diary at TISA for, for taking care mm. of this milk? No, not, not at all, um, because we have built our whole distribution system on actually separating milk in, in 11 different milk types. So all the logistic system has five, uh, mm. <coughs> five holes in, uh, in, in uh, where we we'll pick up the milk. And when we are used to making Jersey milk from Jersey cows, mm. H2A2 milk, which is going to 100% separate also the production facility. So, so we have no practical problems in, mm. in handling Torsten's milk and also the two other farmers who is doing the grass fed milk. Maybe they're not agree with me in the dairy, but uh, <laughs> basically, uh, Okay. It's, it's just a different milk, and we have the system. And I guess at the end of the day, the different do, doing that cost efficiently could be different, could be difficult. But we have built the system historically, so it's no problem to us. Finally, I would say that we have built what we call, like now we have a turnover of, of uh, in the area of 1.2 uh, billion Danish kroner. Basically, we have built a small dairy inside the dairy to so handle when we do. Like when we only do 300 or 500 SKUs per week, we have built a special area in the center of the dairy where we are able to do mini productions or trial productions. Um, because we know that customers appreciate getting something differentiated. So we have made a special dairy in the middle of the dairy. Mm. And then when we have made proof of concept, then we basically put it into the bigger area afterwards. But, uh, it takes some time. Yeah, I do understand. Yes, we are a little bit smaller than you are, but uh, it was very interesting uh, to hear that the consumers are interested in that kind of, of, of product. I basically, if you take the car driving through the US, I think on every corner there will be grass fed meat. Okay. So everybody is actually aware of the benefits mm -hmm. of grass fed. So, so that's okay. Good, good to hear. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question here in the chat from. Gunnella to Torsten, uh, have you mentioned in the yearly production per cow in ECM? I'm not sure what that is myself. Maybe energy, Gunnella, energy corrected milk. That's instead of saying kilograms, uh, it's uh, adjusted to that uh, if there is more fat in the milk, it's more rich or it could be more thin milk. So it's energy corrected milk. It's just, just instead of kilograms, mm -hmm. you could say. Uh, yes, I understand. Uh, there are some possibilities of, uh, there are differences between farmers, of course, as you know. Uh, for, on my farm, I, I have the most extensive way of producing grass milk, uh, and my cows are sending, uh, giving about, about 6,000 liters uh, per cow, and uh, the other farmer the other two farms with grass milk where you there are some possibilities of using other other things for feeding for example you can use the you can use uh, vegetables that are discarded if you understand if you have some collaboration with some vegetable producer and uh, the other farmer is uh, doing that and uh, i think his cows are producing between seven and eight thousand liters of grass milk mm. And you, there's also the possibility in our, it's, you, you have to understand that this, when we say grass milk, we mean the teaser concept. We have created this concept of how to produce grass milk in teaser. And we have set up some rules for us farmers who wants to produce it. And that there are many different rules, uh, animal welfare systems and so on. But there's also something with the feed and you can also, for example, uh, use, uh, uh, grass that is dried into uh, pellets, maybe you know it in Sweden, and uh, the other farmer is using that. I'm not using that. I'm only using grass. So, of course, my uh, yield per cow is lower than what you could achieve if you want to uh, do some extra. So, but it's in this region from 5,000 to up to 8,000 kilos. Thank you. Um, and I should say also that you're very welcome to ask your questions yourself if you want to, and you can then um, raise your hand 
and uh, there's a reaction button where you can press and raise your hand and I will give you the word. Uh, and we also have a question here in the chat from Margarita uh, to you, Torsten, about what other types of crops you are growing for direct human feed. Uh, my main focus is on the potatoes. I have uh, 50 hectares of potatoes and it's divided into uh, three types, uh, direct uh, potatoes for boiling or direct consumption. And then I have uh, these for pommes frites potatoes. And then I also have for crisps, about one third for each. And then I have, uh, I, I grow grains for, we have an organic uh, bakery called Aurion. And I grow uh, different varieties of grains for them. And then, uh, yeah, I also produce, I uh, also in a teaser, a teaser product, we produce uh, oats for our oat drink. I don't know if you call it oat milk in Sweden, but we, we call it oat drink in Denmark. And then I also produce, uh, I have I have had some red beets and some, uh, what's it called? Another root crop. <laughs> Uh, and then I have uh, rye for bread also, and then I also have barley for making beer or malt. Yeah. That's about it. But it changes a lot from uh, from year to year. I uh, I always look in the market and see what is uh, what is necessary or what is uh, what is what you can get a high price for. I try to, from my point of view, I try to make uh, contracts every year before I sow the market. Field, I already have sold the crop, but it depends from farmer to farmer. And uh, of course, you can say that this new kind of thinking in the the way of farming, uh, we produce the milk and um, a lot of other crops. But it's the milk; it's the the extra price for the milk. I, I mean, it's only the milk that gets a higher price compared to to the market price. I don't know if that's reasonable in a way. I've sometimes been thinking, why is it only the milk that is high? For example, I get no extra price for the meat. I get no extra price for the grains or, or whatever. So yeah, but that's the way it is at the moment. But we, we are trying to, I would really like to, to have this uh, grass fed meat because that's a part of our production anyway, and we produce it anyway. Uh, and it's a big, uh, I, I, I work, I studied one year in England in the 90s, and at that time, over 20 years ago, this grass-fed meat was already then quite a big issue. And as you said, Peter, in America also now, grass-fed meat is all over the place. But still, we have not been able to uh, to market grass-fed meat in Denmark. Uh, uh, Torsten, you put me on a little bit of pressure in front of an audience. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a question about the education of the consumers. <laughs> we have. Yeah, there is another question here in in the chat. I think it is it's definitely to Torsten also. It is about holistic management from uh, uh, Matlust, uh, and wondering if you are using or interested in that concept of uh, uh, changing the paddock very uh, very often as as in holistic management. Yes, uh, definitely. I, I've been doing that for the past uh, three or four years now. And we have uh, the cows, they come out from every milking. They are milked twice per day. And every time they go out, they go to a new paddock. So we have about, uh, and, the, and I aim to have about 40 days between they come to a paddock. So every time they go out, they come out to a paddock where the grass is uh, maybe uh, 40 centimeters high. And I, I like to, uh, that, that the clover, and we also use uh, herbs, different kinds of herbs that they, they are able to flower before the cows go into the field. So 
it's quite uh, interesting too when you see the field where the cows are, are grazing they, it's so full of uh, insects because it's it's a high crop and it's full of flowers so it's a it's, 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 a, it's a really biodiversity uh, rich area and i like to see that uh, maybe it goes maybe that my production is a little bit lower because i do it like that but I, I like to do it like that. It, it looks really, it, it feels nice to have the cows into a, a rich field, high grass. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would also, Hans, I know that you have also some, some question. Yeah, I like to look a bit into the future and uh, we have participants in uh, this seminar, of course, most of them from Sweden, but we also have uh, Estonia and uh, Poland uh, active here and listening because I think there is a, a big, uh, a big uh, pressure. It's very interesting concept, uh, and we really like to. Uh, I know there are a lot of consumers in Sweden that want this, and I know that there are also many uh, producers like, that would like to. Uh, to work in this way. So uh, I would like to hear from uh, uh, Peter and Torsten uh, if you would look at a new country uh, to introduce grass-fed milk where we don't have the concept. Uh, what do you think would be the most important things to think about uh, when getting started? Uh, Yeah, that's that's one. Do you question. want me to answer, Torsten? I, I can say something. Uh, I was thinking in in Tisa, we we had a trip to Norway with all our seventy two farmers uh, last year, the year before, just before Corona, and uh, it was quite interesting because, of course, you have to take in into account the climate of where you have your farm. For example, in, in as far as I know, I have never been there, but in New Zealand, for example, you can have your cows outside the whole year round. And of course, it's much more easy to have a grass fed production in, in an area like that. And uh, in Norway, for example, they, they are really as the farms we saw anyway, they were really dependent on, on these concentrate for the cows because they could not make enough uh, grass silage. So of course, maybe I, I just to say that you have to look on the, the climate zone of where your farm is, if it's possible. It, uh, if you want to have grass fed milk and you only have uh, the possibility of cows getting outside for two months per year, for example, it's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. That's, that was just my, my point of view. So that you, Peter, you can say. Yeah, so you mean that you would you would really start with this with a study trip to uh, to get people in, inspired to uh, get started and to to make the concept localized to fit the local area. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to add something also about advice to? No, I'll just say that basically what we're talking is saying that is we have some areas, uh, depending on climate zones, where we're able to produce it. But Tisa is Tisa, and we make uh, and produce and manufacture products in Tisa. So we are not going to enter and make a new dairy in Sweden or New Zealand or anywhere else. So, so we need to commercialize the product based on current uh, suppliers and hence at the end of the day, where we're going to focus uh, on exports of grass, but that would basically be cheese and butter because it has a shelf life for more than 50, 50 mm. days. Mm. So, so we are not going to buy uh, a dairy in Sweden or entering a, a partnership with a foreign country. So far, so far. So far, and no thoughts about uh, franchising concepts and things like that either. You never know. You never know. <laughs> There's a question also from Margareta. Raise your hand. Yeah, th thank you very much. I, I didn't know if I was allowed to raise more questions because I think th this is really very interesting. 
And I was just just adding that I, I had an opportunity to go to New Zealand and stay there for half a year. And it's really interesting. I think that much, very much a lot we can learn from them and also bring back to Swedish farmer, for example. And for example, this about how they are using winter crops for pasturing long so that you could keep cows out longer and different types of crops. And I guess I think you are using them in Denmark as well. Uh, but I, I just I was curious to hear a little bit about future because I, I guess you, you know that we have uh, research going on here in Sweden by keeping uh, cow and calves together for a longer period, like together, like four or five or six, even six months. Is that something that you have been thinking about or I was, maybe the question is to Torsten and or Peter? If this is, is this something that is discussed in Denmark or do you think this will come as well? Or? I think you could start by the requirements <coughs> for, for grass fed milk, Torsten. Uh, yes, uh, I, I was thinking you were, you were going to tell about this uh, co yeah. milk. <laughs> I'll do that afterwards. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but but we, we have been discussing it uh, quite a lot in this concept, and we uh, we ha we agreed by uh, is it four days I think uh, the the calf uh, is with the mother for four days. Of course, it could be much longer, but uh, that is in our concept. And then we we also have another type of milk in the dairy, where the calf is with the mother, or at least with some some other cow that gives milk. Uh, for about uh, three months. Uh, Peter, maybe you can tell about it. Yeah, yeah we have um, a different concept called a libitum. That's when, like, when you're sweet, you go to a restaurant, then you can have free wine and free booze for three months. Then we call the milk a libitum. And there the cows are going with the mother, or what we call them, yeah. aunt, for three months. So that's a different uh, concept of milk that we're building and uh, also quite popular. But easy to understand, but in terms of CSR, climate and stuff like that, it is okay, but you're really more talking to the heart of people than the brain. So it's a less strong concept than the grass with milk, mm -hmm. which contains everything and captures everything in pieces. So we have a lead of uh, milk, but um, and that's that's doing okay, but but not as strong as grass fed concept, not at all. Mm -hmm. I would also like to to add that uh, I had this concept for three years, where the calves were reared by the by the mother or by another cow. Uh, we had uh, three calves per cow, and I have all the calf. I have a calving season, like in New Zealand, I, all calves are born in summertime. So we had these 120 calves at the same time, and it looked really well, but. <laughs> I, I experienced some problems later on with the calves when we were taking them inside and we were going to inseminate the heifers. They were quite uh, wild animals and they were kicking and uh, difficult to, uh, to control by humans. And I have employees on the farm. So I decided to go away from the system again and uh, going back to the, the old system. And now we, we are taking the, the calves, they are four to five days with their mother. And then we take the, the cow, calves inside in a, in a common box where there are uh, six calves in each box. And I think it's working really well. And the calves, they join the other calves. Of course, they are unsatisfied for the first day, but then they are, we, we, we feed the milk with a, with a rubber teat. And I think it works well. And then the most important thing is that the animals, they get uh, used to human humans and so we can we can deal with them and, and my employees can work with the animals uh, without getting injured and which is also quite important or really important we, we cannot risk that uh, they have their broken legs or something because they're kicking too much so it's it's always like in any production with with animals there's a, a that there are dilemmas we have to choose between two bad things and what's what to emphasize most, and uh, I, I have chosen this uh, direction in my farm. Thank you so much, and uh, sorry to have to stop a really interesting discussion. Um, but now it's four o'clock, and we just want to say thank you so much to Torsten and to Peter, and also to Klaus for 
being here and presenting and sharing your experiences. And uh, thank you everyone who participated and for all your questions and really, uh, yeah, interesting discussion. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.